It was late morning in the tent colony of Ludlow, Colorado, April 20th, 1914. The McClearly family were preparing for their Greek Easter celebration when bullets ripped through their tent home. John and Dominka McClearly and their two sons were lucky to escape alive. Too late, they realized they were missing their 18-month-old daughter, Mary. They ran along the tracks just under gunfire. When they got up to the Black Hills, they realized there was no Mary. Bridget McClearly Arkmont, Mary's daughter, related in an interview with the Pueblo chieftain after her mother, Mary McClearly, the last survivor of the Ludlow Massacre, died in 2007. According to Bridget, family lore tells that a 16-year-old boy from a different tent colony who heard Mary's cries, found her, wrapped her up in his coat, and hid in the trees around the camp. Mary told her daughter that her family finally found them a few days later, hidden in the trees. In later years, the Ludlow Massacre would become known as the bloodiest labor strike in the entire U.S. What made the strike different? Load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Imagine this, long hours of back-breaking work, brutal underground conditions, dangerous situations, and all this for very little money. This was in store for any miner willing to work at the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company in Ludlow, Colorado. Add to that, you had to live in a company town, which meant you had to buy goods at company-owned stores for very inflated prices. So when they're right mind would agree to work like that, quite a few people, it turns out, in fact, for any miners, it wasn't any other choice. The, uh, the West was supposed to be a place of great opportunity. It was supposed to be a place where you came and found a fortune, and that was, of course, maybe more 19th century than 20th century, but that's still hanging around in the early 20th century, this sense of hope and possibility that the West is supposed, supposed to uh, deliver. And the West was, by many people's judgment, many scholars' judgment, the most industrialized place in the United States, really. If you wanted to see, the great historian Frederick Jackson Turner once said that if you wanted to see industrial tensions at their greatest, you should go to the Rocky Mountain West. In the fall of 1913, the miners had reached their limit. They released a list of demands and threatened a strike if they weren't met. Professor Patty Limerick from Center for the American West said miners faced a terrible dilemma. Mine owners really had to decide that they would pay people for making the workplace safe. And some of them did and some of them didn't. And it's a terrible calculation to have to make mm -hmm. in the course of your work day. Do I want to be alive or do I want to be well paid? On September 23, 1913, when these ten demands were rejected, the Ludlow strike was caught, and so began nearly a year-long war between miners and the mines. After the strike was called, the miners packed up and moved into poorly crafted tent colonies. After six months of violence and deaths of 21 people on both sides of the conflict, the tension between the miners and the mine owners reached the boiling point. Finally, fed up with the miners' stubbornness, Rockefeller requested that Colorado Governor Elias Emmons to send in the Colorado National Guard. In response, Emmons immediately sent guards under the command of General John Chase. Chase was well known for his involvement in strike breaking at coal mines in Cripple Creek in 1903. He said poor choice to leave the guard, he to exercise no control over his men. To make the situation worse, he chose Carl Lindefeld, a violent mercenary with a major anger management problem, to lead National Guard troops stationed in and around the Ludlow and Canada. Linderfeld constantly harassed and abused the miners and their families by ordering the death special, an armored car mounted with a gap to drive through the encampment at random times firing at them. Linderfeld also enjoyed physically assaulting the miners. In order to protect themselves, miners dug trenches or foxholes to hide from the gunfire. While the death special, Linderfeld's mother reached for the crush. In the evening of April 19th, 1914, rumors reached Linderfeld that the miners had been secretly bringing in powerful weapons. The next morning, with suspicions high among the guardsmen, Linderfeld, the small contingent, swooped down on the tent colony and began firing into the tents. Men, women, children, and pets ran for cover. The train that brought the troops into Ludlow grabbed as many miners and their families as they could, saving many of them from the gunfire. As the fighting continued, 
Stray bullet narrowly misses Louis Tikus by inches. Tikus, a Greek immigrant union organizer, had been visiting from Denver to negotiate on behalf of the miners. Helen Korich, seven years old at the time, recounted the deaths of her pets as she and her family scrabbled to escape. I had a little puppy behind the kitchen stove, and we had our other dog, Princess. She started running with us, and they shot her. They killed the puppy, too. The first human death occurred relatively quickly after the firing began. Frank Rubio, a union organizer who was running with his family, was struck by a bullet. It smashed into his head, blasting away a large part of his skull and killing him instantly. As the soldiers advance on the miners, many women and children flee to underground bunkers or foxholes. At around 11.30, the militia received reinforcements, including 7,000 extra rounds of ammunition, additional strike breakers, and approximately 40 fresh militiamen. The most of the miners retreated late in the afternoon, leaving Linderfeld and his men to loot the tents in the tent colony. Then someone had the idea to set fire to the camp. The fighting ended and Linderfeld was victorious. Besides all the loot he plundered, he also took three prisoners. Louis Tikus, James Filer, and another unidentified man. Linderfeld's final act of cruelty was to murder these men in a particularly horrific way. Linderfeld proceeded to smash Tikus on the head with the butt of his rifle so hard that it broke the gun stock. The blow to Tikus' head was so brutal that it actually cracked his skull. With that, Linderfeld left the situation to Sergeant Cullen, who proceeded to shoot all three prisoners to death. Linderfeld never regretted what he had done. All he said was, Well, boys, looks like I just spoiled another perfect rifle. It wasn't until the next morning in the smoldering ashes of the destroyed camp that they discovered the bodies of 14 women and children, all suffocated to death in the death pit. Although the miners lost, the news of the Ludlow Massacre went nationwide. Colorado mines were still not able to unionize, but Ludlow inspired union organizers all over the U.S. But closer to home, in the immediate aftermath, Ludlow fueled additional violence in Colorado. The following telegram was sent to Governor Ammons by the Boulder County Undersheriff on April 28, 1914, just eight days later. Sheriff Buster at Heckle Mine, Louisville, surrounded by striking miners who are shooting up the mine. Unable to communicate with Sheriff, unable to control the situation. Under Sheriff and its acting Sheriff, under the situation as it exists, I call upon you as Governor of the State of Colorado to send any available troops to our assistance, our LU, Under Sheriff, Boulder County. The violence eventually prompted Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, to send in federal troops to Colorado to end the violence. The coal mine war also spurred the Wilson administration to issue a report on the region. I transmit here forth for the information of the Congress. Report to me in the matter of labor difficulties in the coal fields of Colorado during the years 1914 and 1915. Woodrow Wilson, the White House, March 8th. 1916. Because of the uproar among citizens of Colorado, Governor Ammons eventually issued a list of people who be court-martialed for the actions taken at the Lodlow Tent Court. But the only guardsman who was ever convicted was Carl Linderfeld. His brutal treatment of Tegas and two other miners led to his demotion. Ironically, a few years later, tax rules showed that he was working as a miner out in New Mexico. Governor Ammons ran for re-election, but was rejected by the voters in a landslide. At the same time, the state house was flipped to Republican majority, rejecting Ammon's party, the Democrats. For John D. Rockefeller Jr., the events at Ludlow were a blow to his reputation. Although he continued to oppose unionization of any miners under his control, he even attempted to set up a company-controlled union. Changes in federal law protecting union organization ended that experiment. Between September 1913 and May 1914, 75 people died in an effort to unionize Colorado coal mines, on April 20th, 1914, 18 people alone died. 17 were killed by Colorado Guardsmen. Of those, 14 women and children were killed as well as an innocent bystander. Only one Guardsman was killed that day. Professor Dean Seda, co-director of the Colorado Coalfield War Archaeological Project, had this to say. But, you know, what, what did come out of the strike ultimately was something called the company union, which, uh, company union movement, which did give workers some say in... Uh, some control over their lives, and eventually that would pave the way to the real union successes of the 1930s. It was early springtime and the strike was on. It drove us miners out of doors, out from the houses that the company owned. We moved into tents 
up at old Ludlow. 